Oh, now it's live. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to our roundtable discussion. Oh, we have some Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, so as a protocol, we just wanted to start out with some introductions. So if you guys um, want to stay on mute until it's your turn to speak, that would be great as well. Um, and then we'll kind of do it just like in a popcorn format. Um, so I will go first. My name is Nicole Kalaustro. I am a senior at Loyola University Chicago. Um, and I'm also the uh, vice president internal on MAFA board this year. Um, Joseph. Hello, um, I'm Joseph Malasa. I'm a third year at the University of Virginia. Um, I'm the current president of the Organization of Young Filipino Americans, uh, which is the organization here at UVA. Um, and so basically it's over 300 members. Um, and I met Nina at NAFA's um, leadership summit. Um, in San Francisco and so basically she invited me to come here um, and I was really just interested because our upcoming cultural shows coming up um, and hearing about in the west coast and kind of in um, hearing about Battle of the Bamboo um, it was really cool to see it because for us it's just been a very like isolated we do the same thing every year um, there's a lot of tradition with it um, but I think it's lost a lot of its meaning over time um, and it's become very technical and less about the culture and more about kind of just doing the dances and getting the people to come out. And so I wanted to talk about that and that's why I'm here. Uh, Nina, go ahead. Hello, my name is Nina. Um, I currently go to Wayne State University in Detroit and um, I'm part of the Filipino Student Society there. And I'm also serving as MAFA's Vice President External this year. Um, so popcorn to Rafi. Wait, Rafi, we can't hear you, but I'm going to popcorn to somebody else while I figure that out. Kavante, your turn. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kavante. I, um, I'm a, a sophomore at East, at East Michigan University, and I'm part of the uh, Capamalia Club. I'm also an intern under Nina for uh, VPE, so yay for that. Um, I don't know much about the culture dances, but like I'm here to like learn about them and like see what your opinions on like the dances and like the culture and like the workshops and things are. So you know, I'm hope I'm intrigued to like learn more about your guys' perspectives of that stuff. You know, because I am an outsider of everything. So yeah. And it's nice to meet everyone who I have not met yet. Uh popcorn to uh let's see. Uh Lydia. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Can she hear me? Is it my turn? Can you guys Lydia? Yes, did you say it is your turn, Lydia? Yes, you... Hi, oh, I'm my sorry. Name, my name is Lydia. Uh, um, I'm a dancer. I dance for Pernal Dance Company. I've toured with uh, several cultural groups around the U.S. and the world. And I'm happy to help answer your questions. Um, I'm just going over the document that you guys have over here. So I have a better perspective of what to tell you. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Can we popcorn to, um, Natalia and Sarah Lynn? Hi, I'm Natalia. And I'm Sarah Lynn. We're co-founders of Filipino Kitchen, a food, media, and events company that is based in Chicago that we do a lot of craziness and we're really great friends with um, Lydia. That's why we kind of broke her in in this <laughs> discussion. <laughs> so popcorn to Jesus Christ. Uh, I cannot see. I names. know the names are very small. Slash. Oh. So I'm going to go popcorn to we are Mafa. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. So, um, I think I'm going to go straight here and just, you know, be real with everybody. Um, 
as what I would normally do. So um, can somebody give me like a quick background of what the Battle of the Bamboo is? Is, is this just in Chicago? And is this a performance that you're per preparing for or is this something that already happened? So Battle of the Bamboo is a, it's an annual, um, I guess, competition slash event that is held at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and it's, it did already happen. It was in, um, this past February, um, but other schools in the Midwest participate, participate in it. And they have the option of either competing or they have the option of just doing an exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, like an exhibition performance, whether it's like cultural or um, like a modern dance performance kind of thing. Right. Um, most schools that do compete, we have like certain guidelines and stuff like that. And we are judged amongst three judges that um, are selected by the Filipino org at UIC. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if Nina or Emily, you guys have anything to add? Yeah. So uh, first of all, um, Okay, granted, it's, it's a competition and they have an option to demo or to compete, right? And then are you guys organizing it or are you thinking of performing on it? Um, I think we have a variety, like amongst all of us have a variety wow. of our, our experience with Battle of the Bamboo. For example, like I have performed in Battle of the Bamboo in my college mm -hmm. career. Um, some people have been audience members, some people have been competitors. Um, mm -hmm. But so we do have a, a wide variety of people and their experiences on Battle of the Bamboo. But I think specifically for this workshop, we were talking about as a whole, like Filipino cultural dances and stuff like that. Okay. Because um, I think that that's, you know, um, first of all, I don't want you guys to feel bad about, you know, doing what you do and starting up you know, performing at Battle of the Bamboos or like, you know, um, demonstrating what you know, whether that's based off of, you know, YouTube or you've watched a PCN from the West Coast or the East Coast or whatever. Um, it's a good start and it's a good beginning for you guys to sort of like cultivate that kind of like uh, Filipino American culture where you are. Um, I think, um, you know, one thing that you know uh that a lot of filipino dance groups are being challenged about is how they communicate their work right um there are a lot of perspectives on how people look at philippine dance because um there are different ways on how people learn philippine dance one is through bayanihan dance company which is the international dance group that you know um, the Philippines had. And what they did is that they did a little bit of research in different parts of the Philippines. Um, they brought it to Manila, um, basically organized it in you know, a Western stage uh, in such a way that it can be appreciated by the Western eyes and the Western audience. And that piece of work that they had is what they used to like tour around the world essentially. So people like you guys who have no, you know, maybe some of you have seen, you know, some authentic, so to speak, Philippine dance from the Philippines, some have not, you know, will have a better appreciation of it in, you know, in a theatrical form, right? So that's one way there are people who makes an effort to go back home, spend months, weeks, years to sort of like just learn how they do things and then interpret it in their own form and recreate it. There are people who does the same thing and then they just basically like tear it apart and do it in their own, you know, creative way. So there are many ways in doing that, right? Am I making sense? Yeah, so I think I only see this. I can't hear anybody. So I hope you, you can hear me. Um, so I think that um, one thing that you guys have to remember, if you're going to recreate, let's say, Tinikling, or, you know, there, there's a Tinikling group in Hawaii who uses bamboos, does like some of the basic movements of Tinikling, 
and then uh, dances it to hip hop and R&B. There's nothing wrong with that. Just don't call it Philippine dance. Just don't call it traditional. Just don't call it authentic. Own it, you know. So let's say, let's say I put up a group like, you know, my Filipino ex dance troupe, right? You know, I can tear tinikling apart, do all kinds of ballet moves and pole dancing on the bamboo. And I can call it my own work inspired by Filipino dance or Filipino traditions or Filipino practices. But you can't just say that it's Philippine dance flat out. So this is the thing about, and I'm pretty sure Natalia and Sarah Lynn is, uh, you know, uh, would understand this. Um, you know, just number one, to avoid like, you know, all the haters that sort of like will give you shit about m misrepresentation. You either own it or you really have to communicate it very well. And it takes a lot of work to do that. So, you know, um, yeah. I think, you know, that's kind of like the whole essence of what I wanted to do based on how I understand what you guys need. Um, you know, there are a lot of, you know, people who put together their dance forms and, you know, their dance creations based off of what they see on YouTube. And that's fine. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of PCNs is what they call it here in California. Um, PCN groups, it's, Filipino cultural night and they have like this whole, you know, night of exhibiting basically traditional dances. Um, you know, most of them, they just work off of YouTube and that's fine. You know, really it, 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 it costs two grand to get to the Philippines, really dig deep into like the culture and the traditions there for you guys to come up with a show. Right. So YouTube, it works. It's kind of like an entry point for a lot of college students and a lot of people who are just sort of like getting their feet wet into Philippine dancing. But, you know, um, as you know, the next generation following us, what I want you guys to understand is be able to really communicate your work. If you got it from YouTube, just be honest with it, you know, just be upfront. Oh, yeah, I found these dances on YouTube. And then I just, you know, I just decided I want to add like a handkerchief in like my little pangalai moves to look good. That's fine, you know, or, you know, um, if you found, let's say you find like a Bayanihan you know, a Bayanihan dance group um, performance on YouTube, just be upfront with it. Oh, yeah, this is based off of, you know, Bayanihan dance group's performance in 1970, whatever, or 1980 something, you know, and it's perfectly fine. Um, yeah, so that's, that's all I have to say about, I think, what you're trying to do. Um, and you know, I have three minutes, so if you have any questions, feel free to raise them. So I guess just going off, and this is going to be one of our discussion questions later. Um, for example, one thing that you said was um, like if you add um, an, an extra prop or an extra like the handkerchief that you were saying earlier, if we if we were to add that, do you think it um, especially for people that are trying to get more of like the storytelling part of the Filipino cultural dances, which is something that we really want to focus on, do you think that those certain aspects end up like changing the story or how important those costumes are or props are to the storytelling of what's happening within the dance? It depends. So let's say Malong, right? Do you have a good understanding of how Malong is used over there? And then there you go. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. We all don't, you know, it took me a long time for me to understand. Um, recently, I just learned that some Malong moves is based off of martial arts. Yeah, I was like mind blown, right? Even um, Pandango Sa Ilaw are actually martial arts moves before it became dance. You know, the, the big thing on the shoulder for the uh, saya or like the Filipiniana clothing, 
they used to keep knives on those things, right? That's the same reaction that I had. So, um, you know, so first things first, do you have a good understanding of that? If you don't, it's totally fine. It could be like, oh yeah, I saw someone, you know, I saw some Philippine performance using a malong, but in my case, I'm gonna make it, you know, I'm gonna wrap it all over my belly and that's fine. This is a traditional clothing, but I'm inspired by this and I'm presenting it as this way because this is my own piece of work. This is my own art. This is not anybody else's. Yes, I'm inspired by this malong, by this clothing, but this whole concept and this whole story that I'm telling you right now is my story. It's not anybody else's story. It's not my ancestor's story. It's not, you know, it's not um, the Mindanao people's story or it's, it's, it's not the Ilocano story. This is my story as Filipino American. And then you can, you can even mention your lineage, right? You know, my mom is from Cebu, my dad is from whatever, you know, but it's your own story. You just really need to own it. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Did anybody else have a question before um, Lydia has to leave? Oh, go ahead, Joseph. Um, so hello, um, uh, for me, um, so I'm from Virginia. And so I guess our organization was founded on people who were inherently very Filipino because they had come from the Philippines. Um, but as the generations go on, um, the dance itself is stuck with it. But the purpose kind of like a lot of the people kind of who are doing the dances have never seen the Filipino dance before um, and are just starting to do it in college. Um, and the audience has never seen it before. So I guess kind of keeping that in mind, um, how would you kind of promote or slash advocate, I guess that kind of, how would you empower new dancers to kind of like, again, express the Filipino culture while some of them aren't even, um, at least in my organization, Filipino? Um, and how would you kind of advocate to kind of making the dance, again, that preserving the culture, but still being familiar and not so uncomfortable. But that's the thing, that's the problem that I think is a big thing about this cultural dance um, kind of expression is that it's often that um, my organization or just Filipinos in general are scared to own it, you know what I mean? So how do you kind of deal with that? Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, this was uh, raised um, by a family gathering that I had about a year and a half ago with my cousins in the Midwest, right? Um, I have a lot of family in Kansas City and their parents uh, sort of like really assimilated well with the culture and mind you not, they, they're the only people of color in like that big village they had. They have a small Filipino community there but you know it's it's very tiny to the point where it's the same thing they don't know what the fuck they're doing you know they they've never seen real philippine dance before they they have no but they just really want to keep on doing it so the intention is really clean and well you know and that's fine and i think one of my cousins raised a question one time is that you know and this personally made me feel bad because he was just he was just like you know, so what's next for you guys? You're just gonna, you know, flaunt all your work there. And then we're here in the Midwest and we're left with nothing because we don't have resources. They, they don't have, you know, we don't have master artists here like you do and all that stuff, right? And I'm like, you know what, you're making a point, but like this step that you're taking right now in trying to like, ask these questions from people like me and from people from the west coast who has you know more resources is a great step we also have our challenges here mind you not we have 14 dance groups in this area um some compete with each other some don't but we i, I i'd like to think that we're all allies right but we're also still navigating through you know, um, how do we represent the culture in, in, in a better way than we've, we've already been having for the past 20, 20, 30 years, right? So I don't think it's something that you have to feel bad about, but because you already have this knowledge and you have this 
this outlet right now, make use of it. And then, you know, um, for people who are really like really deprived of, you know, um, having access to it, I mean, a couple of things that they can do is really find people who has access to it and communicate with them. You know, it's not really difficult to, you know, hit someone up on Facebook or Instagram anymore. All the dance companies have their own Instagram and Facebook pages. It's, it's, it should not be that difficult. And then second, if, if, if they're, they, they truly believe that they're ignorant enough um, from, you know, from, from the actual culture and the dances, then you know they should be responsible in taking the next steps and how to make that better you know what i mean and and if not it's still a good thing that they're trying you know there's an effort there that somehow you need to appreciate um instead of like looking down on it you know what i mean and if you see it you as a person, if you see it and you have this access through me and, you know, I'd love to open this up to, you know, other um, cultural dancers as well, then, you know, offer it to help. If, if, the, if, if the intent is really to uplift the culture, then it doesn't, you know, what's stopping you from like helping out and reaching out, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Um, I hate to say this, but I have to go. Um, I, you guys are welcome to add me on Facebook. We can open up a chat message and, you know, I'll, I'll be up. It's, it's seven o'clock here. I just, I have a Tagalog class in like 10 minutes. So, um, but uh, yeah, I, I'd be more than happy to like, you guys are on the calendar invite. I'd be more than happy to answer any more questions. If you want to have another phone call, I'd love to do it. So, and this is Ron. Hello. <laughs> he's, our, he's our master Kulintang player in the House of Gongs. Hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. Hello. Thank you. Miss so. you. Long time no see. No, don't do it now. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> All right. And then, um, you know, if there's an avenue, we're looking for tours to like teach and do workshops. Uh, I'd love to go to Chicago. I've, I haven't been there in like two years. So, you know, we'd love to put up a show there. Ron is releasing his EP this year. So we can, we can, we can, you know, we can fold in a workshop, um, a workshop music and everything so if you guys can organize something we're down to go there oh yeah we organized something it's called cultura that's right that's in, that's in october <laughs> yeah okay well your girl i so parangal's uh 10th year anniversary is in october so i i really i'm really tied up all and we have a tour in july so i'm kind of tied up until Lydia, then Lydia, it's in july and august or August 19th. August 19th? Yes. Yep. Okay. That might be a good possibility. We, we're not booked for anything yet on the 19th of August, Ron, Ron right? Uh, he left. Never mind. Okay. Um, uh, let's, let's chat and then, you know, feel free to reach out if you have questions. Um, yeah, I'd love to do a workshop. I'd love to do a little lecture for you guys. Um, I just got back from an immersion trip, so I have a lot of stories to tell. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And I really appreciate everybody for actually opening up this discussion. This is a dialogue that needs to keep on happening on a Philippine dance perspective. Um, and, you know, I'd love to have more of these. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming again. Sorry to cut your time so short because oh, no of our problem. technical difficulties. Oh, but no problem. <laughs> Thank you again. We'll keep in touch. All right. Take care, guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Okay, so also, I can't, if anybody specifically wanted to get in touch with Lydia, I can um, shoot you her email address as well for people that are interested in possibly having workshops or had even more specific questions for her. Um, kind of to dive more into um, 
like the the discussion questions that we had basically today, um, as we kind of went over earlier. And I think if anybody needs to have the um, agenda sent to them, please uh, just message us and we can send that over. I believe you all have access to it. But um, just kind of like what Lydia was saying, a lot of us within the MAFA community, as well as around the nation from what people, from some people that um, I've talked to, especially like with Epic ambassadors as well, there are a lot of people in our organizations that really understand the um, really popular dance is like Tinikling, Banco, Sinkil, Pandango, Seila, like those dances that we typically see, but for those um, that see even more um, a wider variety, similar to the event we were talking about earlier, Battle of the Bamboo, which happened a few weeks ago in Chicago. Um, those types of dances where um, there might be from a specific region or um, a lot of people see a lot of the um, Spaniard influences and um, Catholic and um, Christianity dances, but they don't, but what somebody might see like um, a Muslim inspired piece and not know what's going on. We want to really touch base on the storytelling of all the um, Filipino cultural dances. Um, and maybe the importance of um, the movements and the costumes and the message behind that story. So we kind of almost went through all of the introductions. I know I have Mary Jo, Emily, Umbriel, and Chris Lee who didn't get to go. So if you guys really want to, um, whoever wants to go first, I think Emily, we were on you. If you want to just um, finish your introduction real quick and then we can kind of go on to the discussion questions. Um, hi, okay. Um, so my name is Emily. I am a senior at Michigan State University and I am the secretary for MAFA board and yeah, I think that's it. Um, Chris, you can go next. Oh, hello, my name is Chris and I'm a junior at the University of Toledo. And fun fact is I'm a Korean. Thank you. Chris, and then Mary Jo, go ahead. Cool, hi. <clears throat> hi, my name is Mary Jo. I go to the University of Washington. I'm a senior. Um, I'm the president of the Filipino American Student Association there. And then I'm the Pacific Northwest Epic Ambassador. Yay, thank you guys so much. Um, and thank you for everyone giving their introduction earlier as well. Um, first, I, again, I wanna say thank you to Lydia who was able to make it and thank you to Sarah Lynn and Natalia for giving us the opportunity to have um, you guys come as well as Lydia um, to connect us with Lydia because I think that um, having the perspective from you guys which we'll hear during the round table and then also hearing everything that Lydia said and coming from her background and experience is something that a lot of us um, have not really been able to um, experience at all or even hear about. So that was actually very educational and um, really interesting to kind of hear about um, a lot of her opinions on kind of the things that we were, that the little basis of what this round table is on. Um, but first we can kind of go around uh, for people. We kind of talked about this earlier, but for anybody else that wants to add on, what exactly do you know generally about what Philippine cultural dances are? Or um, maybe if you have any questions about what Philippine about Filipino cultural dances? And also for those of you who haven't gone to a round table, you kind of just shout out and then like just kind of wait in line if somebody else is talking. So uh, just background because I know some of you this is your first time. Okay, so I'll guess I'll go first. Uh, so I don't know like much. I kind of like didn't know like the major ones that like you know that you guys that i see like from like all the pcns and things like that like the nick the nick Ling and like all the other ones so like i don't know much about them but i do like know like you guys like get like inspired by like like the muslim heritage and like spanish culture and like filipino things so like i know like you guys get like in, like the dances are inspired by like those histories but i don't know much i don't, I don't know like I, I don't know any, like, all the dances itself, I guess, to say. <clears throat> yeah, um, I'll contribute some. So I'm lucky enough to be part of, like, our Filipino dance troupe here in the Pacific Northwest called Sayal, and they're based at the University of Washington. And what we were taught was that um, the four basic suites that we dance are <clears throat> rural, 
Barrio Fiesta, which is the Barrio Fiesta Suite, the Mountain Suite, the Spanish Suite, and then the Muslim Suite. Um, and then the Muslim Suite, which like usually has a lot of, uh, we have we perform this piece called Vinta, which is about a princess, and it's all about like royalty and really embodying like Philippine um, kind of prestige. And then it's all about like traveling the seas and like really owning land and being proud. Um, and it's more of a serious piece. And then the Barrio Fiesta Suites are all about like more of the um, provincial dances in which like people come together for celebrating. Um, they're for Pandango Sa Ilao. It's all about the lanterns that would, you know, draw the fishermen home from, uh, from being away at sea or just trying or doing the, some of the like fish throwing dances to celebrate uh, food and kind of like festivals. And then for the Spanish suites, which is obviously inspired by uh, the Spanish colonizers, uh, it, there's a lot of courtship. There's a lot of um, really formal, playful, but very elegant dances in which like everyone is dressed to the nines and like um, the costumes are really do play a really important part and props play an important part of like telling the stories of like how people were would interact in like kind of aristocratic uh settings and then the mountain which are mountain suites were which we were inspired by from um tribes located i believe in the north northern part of the philippines they are all about um they represent like chickens and like they're always also like ritual dances for like when people are courting one another um and they themselves like they're they have like the loincloth and like the stacking of the the pots and symbolizing the women going getting water and the men providing food and things like that so but we don't necessarily get to go in deep deep into like who like what tribes or like what indigenous people actually like when did they do it or like why they did it and that's always something that we are continuously trying to discover okay we're gonna go and jump in on on this um by any means um just a disclaimer sarah and i are not dancers um we work in the food industry more specifically the filipino food industry but there's a lot of intersectionalities and because of the communities that we have um created and the spaces that we have created we have relationships with these like you know like lydia like for example um and other cultural practitioners um right sarah and i are a little bit more akin to history um definitely context um yes we have been exposed to these dances i myself was born and raised in the philippines and sarah has been you know um part of um fsas or psas or how whatever essay you want <laughs> um but basically like you know just going off what you said uh mary joe okay thank you <laughs> sorry there's a lot of y'all we should have had name tags um <laughs> just go in go in with what you said and there's a couple like um to be honest kind of like cringy uh moments that we were having is definitely needing the context right definitely identifying those tribes definitely identifying the reasons why those dances exist um definitely identifying like um your example for your provincial um provincial dances a lot of those dances are combat dances um lydia referred to that earlier but um you know, even Sarah and I know know people who practice um, Eskrima. And normally, like, the people that we have learned from, um, that's the first thing they tell us, uh, that a lot of these provincial dances are movements for combat. Um, because, obviously, historically, we needed to hide. We needed to pretend that we're dumb and stupid, that we don't know how to fight um because of the spanish occupation so and then i think we i think for you guys just something to be super mindful with is to be really culturally sensitive when it comes to replicating this dance to a certain degree we agree with lydia that 
own where you learn to dance from, whether it's YouTube, whether it's however context, but always have that disclaimer that it is inspired and don't call it authentic. That we agree upon. But the one thing, the couple of points that we did not agree upon with Lydia was do not stop there. Don't, don't just, just because you claimed it, just because you own it, don't just stop there. Um, I think, a, uh, I think a few of you here in this discussion was in the discussion with us, um, a couple months ago regarding, um, uh, facts V show and, you know, the, the things that we brought up in which we deeply, deeply, amazingly appreciate Kawaiian's efforts to really, um, further their knowledge and, you know, did not perform a battle of the bamboo as we understood. And we admire that we admire that that and we know that our resources is very limited um not everybody can go home for weeks months years to bring you this knowledge and there are people who have uh sarah and i are both raised here in the midwest y'all have more resources than we ever did growing up like we you know from the books that we get from the people that we meet we always constantly do that um i think it's a lot of being conscientious of how you present yourself and how it conveys um from especially when it comes to costuming um because each and every item is specific for a either a ritual or uh, a ceremony that we are not aware and equipped um you know, Sarah and I are just like hashtag blessed to have access to 10,000 artifacts in the field museum and be able to learn and study some of these items and artifacts and how it relates to um, our, our culture, our life, our like, you know, a lot of this kind of moving puzzles. And it's, it's, um, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, like that somebody told us to play pick up 52 <laughs> mm -hmm. um so yeah that's that's our two cents if you guys have any questions or whatsoever like sarah wants to add anything else yeah i mean i think so just to build off what you said so just thinking about art in general like you know even though we work in food writing and photography like it's the same thing it's kind of like the same rules like in writing you cite your sources so you should do the same thing with dance. And just because you did a good job, like it's important to do the best job you can, but like, don't let perfect become the enemy of good. Like that you do it and you do it to the best of your ability. And then afterwards you assess and be like, okay, how can we make this better for next time? And so that when you pass on those dances and that knowledge to the next class of people who come in, then they can build off of where you already started. They're not like trying to recreate the wheel. So um, I would also emphasize too, like, you know, we, I feel like we take smartphones for granted, but like just documenting these things, like either in writing um, with voice memos for the music and then video for, you know, to record how the dances look, um, photos, how the, the um, costuming looks, how the set looks. Um, that's really important. Um, knowledge that you can document and also share with your fellow you know everybody on this call if you want to or you know and with you know the folks who are going to be coming up right behind you who are younger so um i just like you guys to consider that too like build your own like libraries of knowledge to share with each other and also like pass on and yeah when you document you can also like check in with like either send it yeah. to lydia send it send to, to us lydia, yeah Send it to be like, hey, Ate, does this like make sense to you? Yeah. Does this like, you know, we want to do X, Y, Z. Yeah. Does this make sense? Or can you refer us to the right people that can uh, crop, like fact check? And, right. and that's the use of social media. That's the use of networking. That's the use of having Natalia and Sarah at your side. TBH, <laughs> um, because uh, once again, we will reiterate this, us growing up at the time that we grow up and we were at your, at your age, we did not have this access, not at all. Okay. Cool. I, I, 
Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. Oh, I just I had a question, and I I wanted it to ask this to Lydia prior to when she left, but I would also love the input of everyone here. Um, and you can uh you can ask whatever you need to after Nicole, but I there is a for like our our cultural dance troupe. We always have this issue where we really want to make where we want to make dances more LGBTQIA inclusive and like the sp some of the cultural dances and like our, our personal instructors, like they're older, they might be more conservative. And like for some of our queer or non-gender binary conforming um, students that want to participate, they don't feel like these dances are welcoming for them because they have to play stereotypical gender norms or like play heterosexual roles that they don't personally identify with. Or maybe even simply like they want to wear a barong, but like um, we always like our instructors will be like will always caution them that maybe in the privacy of our like small like studio, but we can't when we go to like larger older performances where we have to like perform for maybe more conservative crowds that maybe where like they're scared of having. Um, like non bi or non gender binary conform people wear like like for example like a girl or a person that identifies as a male but physically looks like a woman wear a baron or a mal and and it's just kind of like we as students really want to advocate for more of their voices and want to make this space more inclusive but then there's like combating of like oh this is traditional culture that you shouldn't tamper with and so I don't I don't know. I, I still I still don't know how to like think about this process. I mean, what I'm gonna go tell you to be honest is challenge that and yeah, we'll make it. your space inclusive. Yeah. And if somebody who is passing male and wants to wear a freaking Filipiniana, do it. Literally, do it. And that is your yeah. form of art. That is your form of inclusivity. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't want you to exclude I mean I wouldn't want, if I were that dancer, I wouldn't want to be excluded because like I come to the table in a certain way and like it doesn't seem like the canon of Philippine traditional dance has something for me, then like, then maybe we should just kind of call that out and just say what it is. And, you know, similar to what Lydia was saying about like using hip hop and, and that sort of thing, like, you know, obviously with consent of the dancer in, and dancers involved, right? Um, and then I don't know if there are any dances that that is that's a Lydia question. That I is think definitely a Lydia question. Yeah. That is definitely more. Um, we know in our indigenous culture that we do honor a lot. Uh, we do have a goddess of um, she is andro androgynous, and her name is Lakapati, and she is uh, well. She I, she is the first like you know a like the more allegedly like you know transgendered um goddesses in our indigenous culture because if you do not identify as male or if you're like you know a trans woman or a trans man like in the realm of our indigenous culture this is from what we understood is you're basically have a higher being of understanding both your feminine and masculine therefore you're better than everybody else <laughs> um which is amazing, like that our indigenous cultures have embraced that, have um, uh, that we do have that context. Um, when it comes to your dance, I think, yes, it is a Lydia question. Yeah. But in our own humble freaking opinion, do it. Yeah. Who tells you why? Who tells you not to do it? Yeah. Just why, slap them. Why will we why will we exclude anyone from like wanting to connect with their heritage? Like. That's just selfish. what is there? What is the argument that could possibly count for that? I don't, I don't, for me, I don't feel like there is one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like trying to communicate by hands. Um, <clears throat> so, my question um, was regarding to how you guys were talking about like wanting to cite our resources when we're doing these dances and like um, when we present them and we're performing, like if they're not authentic and if we're bringing our own thing, like we should definitely say that and continue on. Um, 
But my, I wanted to ask like how you guys would recommend us doing that specifically towards like, for example, like at battles, if we're like, if you're a competitor, um, like you have to hold your pose until like throughout judges and we're not technically like, we're not able to like verbally say like we got these resources from so-and-so um, as well as like through the pamphlets or like through the MCs and stuff like that. They only get so much time during their speech to even talk about the performers themselves. Um, they only get so much space for us on the pamphlets. So I guess like my question is like how you guys would recommend us putting in like these resources if we're performing to like a big audience. Social media, use your social media, use your process of documenting and putting it on your social media, or put it on your website, put it up on your website. Um, you know, take maybe however much time that you guys have, like very in a more concise way. Yeah. Like, let's say you did sing kill, but I don't know, you did it with jazz music. I don't know. You'll be like, it's a jazz performance with like sing kill influence. Like that didn't take long. Um, but most importantly, the documentation throughout is like right now, I know a bunch of yeah. FSAs like follow us and, you know, do it in your process of your social media. Like, hey, look, we're prepping for Battle of the Bamboo. I mean, without spilling all your secrets, definitely. Right. You know, because by the end of the day, it's still a competition, but it can be like, you know, you put your artist statements in those yeah. posts. Yeah. In your newsletters, in your... Um, all of you guys are very much, you know, very active at social media. Use it to your best advantage, your Snapchats, your Insta stories, your anything just to address that. So even be, when the show's happening and whoever's following you guys already understands your process. Yeah. And I would just say too, so also in process of, in, in thinking about like documenting it and like, I mean, so I feel like with anything, there's like, there's the rules and then like then there's the ones that you know you can break like i mean you can break every rule but just like what is the reason behind doing that right like that's the purpose of the artist statement so it's to justify why you're doing it in this way like we're cooking um sinigang in a certain way because we're from the midwest and certain things are available here and other ingredients are not available here for example so um how that translates to dance it could be you know like growing up in you know whatever particular town there's this like very specific musical genre that i grew up with and it's called i mean like it could be chicago house it could be like some other very obscure band or music and then i just thought because i'm filipino american or I identify as filipino american these are how we kind of like brought these things together kind of like me so I don't know, this is just a, an example of like how you can think through or like even like you as a, like you're the audience and like I'm kind of like spouting off what might be my artist statement. So then you can say like, oh, now I get why she made that choice. I get why they made that choice. It makes sense, right? So like you kind of want it to have that resonant moment with your audience where it's like, okay, well, I don't really know much about this Muslim dance, but I'm reading a little bit about it. and. Now they're, they're incorporating like Chicago house music and I can see why or how, like what's the common touch point there. So um, that's, I think the point of this artist statement is to kind of say like, this is a new evolution of the traditional dance or it's in this style or in multiple styles and why we're, why we're putting it together in this way. And also the other thing is like, once again, challenge the organization, Yeah, challenge Battle of the Bamboo demand for more time demand for an extra minute just to talk about it because you can go yeah. state how important this is to address it because you don't want to misinform anybody else yeah. um i know there's usually two dance groups there's a modern one and there's a traditional one um you know but either way if you're lacking resources and you're lacking teachers that would be giving you the proper context of everything I think it's fair to demand for more time or demand for more space or once again, it's what would serve you better mm -hmm. as a student, 
as a Filipina, Filipino, Filipinex, as a Filipino adjacent. Yeah. How does that serve you? Yeah. Thank okay, you. Okay, so I'm sorry. I have to like leave because like an 8 a.m. class tomorrow. So can everyone, it was nice meeting you. And like the, the points that you guys were making, I'm 100% of like agreeing with. So like. Oh, thank you, Kevante, for coming. Have a good night. Good night. Okay. Um, cool. Thank you, guys. Um, did anyone else have any comments that they wanted to bring up about this question? Otherwise, we can move on to the next one. Oh, go ahead. Hi. Um, can y'all hear me? I don't know. Just thumbs up. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Cool. Hi. So I don't know if I got to introduce myself. Um, my name is Rafael. I graduated from UCI uh, last June. So I'm a, a alumni from UCI and I was actually one of the uh, packing coordinators. So um, I wanted to bring up kind of what Mary Jo was talking about and what Lydia was talking about. That was very interesting. Um, I really liked what Lydia was saying about owning our dances. So at UCI, we made a conscious effort to change uh, the Filipino culture night and it's now called the Philippine X American culture night because we recognize that the dances that we create and that we end up performing doesn't necessarily sometimes always align with what's histor historically true or what's traditionally, you know, seen. Right. And I think um, what Mary Jo was saying before that was when I was the packing coordinator, that was something that we were also grappling with. You know, what of our members that are gender non-binary or they wish to be, you know, they wish to perform in these dances that aren't traditionally supposed to be by these what? folks, right? We were we were a lot like, oh my gosh, you know, how, how we, you know, we've opened it up, opened the world. Like we changed it now to Philippine X American. That means anything goes, right? And it was really interesting because that fear, it never, it never, it never got realized. You know, we never had issues. Um, we had a lot of, I'm just, I'm just, I guess I'm saying like, if y'all are interested in moving forward with being more inclusive, I definitely believe that you should challenge that and just go for it because we went through with it and it's honestly given us, uh, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback, even from the older folks. Um, our culture night, we have a, uh, traditional, it's called Rondalia. They perform the music during our show and a lot of the older folks are performing for us. And, you know, when they found out that we were doing all this stuff and we were, you know, trying to have this kind of message, they were all for it. So I, I guess I mean, it makes a difference. I mean, we're in Southern California. I don't know if it's like, you know, how we are here, but I think, I think it's a great step into kind of owning that, you know, the performances that we are creating isn't necessarily traditional. It's Philippine X American, right? You know, it's what we're trying to show here. And it's what we're trying to own up to as well, kind of influenced by whatever we're going through with. Um, I know, um, I don't know if other PC, uh, PCNs and other regions have a skit or like a story, kind of a play going on while their show's going on. So within within our PCN, we have a story and the dances are kind of intertwined within the story. And even within the story, it can be controversial to some of our parents. You know, um, just last year we introduced um, LGBTQ scene and it was like super wild and like all the parents were like oh my god these two boys just kissed a lot right so it was really great because from we got a lot of feedback we were challenging things it was different and I, I think it helped a lot of our members kind of get more comfortable so um, yeah it's a challenge right like it's a lot of fear kind of like oh my god ha, how are we going to get this to happen but I think there's a lot of um there's a lot to say in that doing that kind of action, especially if you open up to the members, you know, open up if you want to be able to change things and if you want to make it more inclusive. We brought it up to our members prior to making that change. We're like, hey, we're interested in including more people. We're interested in challenging these notions of, you know, these roles that are traditional. Are you all for it? And we had a vote and everyone was for it, right? So if anything, as long as your members are down for it, then you should be down for it. And that, that's all that matters, right? So I kind of just wanted to say that because that was something that we had a lot of fun with last year, so. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, like, definitely something that, like, we've been, like, as an organization run by, like, student leaders, like, in our spaces, we've been able to, like, be more, like, inclusive. But 
I think for the the issue with maybe me my particular like dance troupe was that the so we we are blessed to have like the same dance teachers and coordinators and like for the past like 20 years and these individuals they don't get paid they just like dedicate their time and they are so committed to like empowering Filipino youth through cultural dance but first but when like we want because we don't want to cross them too much because they do so much for us and they're our elders like that it gets it gets really interesting like we've we've brought this up to them before and they've warmed up to it but it was one of those things where like like i said like we were able to do it in like smaller like university spaces but then when we were trying to perform for example like pagdiriwang or uh pisa sanayon which are like really large filipino festivals in the pacific northwest like they would try to not they wouldn't like outright just be like oh you cannot do it they would just perhaps maybe cast in a way that would make it so that these some individuals would be in some parts that are okay to be more like progressive but then when it came to like what their idea was a more traditional dance that had to be like a man courting a woman and it had to be portrayed like that they would just I just feel like they had the tendency to not cast certain individuals in those roles. And it's frustrating because it's like, we are so much indebted to them because they are teaching us and they're taking time out of their lives to do us and they're their elders. So you don't want to cross them or ever like try to disrespect them. Um, but yeah, like I, I, think, I think it's a constant, constant like um, dialogue that we have to have with our instructors and it's just it's just something that I wanted to see if any other like student or dance group or other cultural dance group had experience and like whether or not they found like a middle ground you know Sarah, Sarah Lynn or Natalia did you guys have anything to add to um, either Raphael's or um, Mary Jo's um, comment Thread lightly when you're when you're talking to your to your elders. Um, you know we don't look like it, but yes, we are your elders. <laughs> um, but I think I think just in general, opening up that dialogue. If yeah. you show them how important it is to create a very inclusive environment, then I think they would respond better. Um, mm -hmm. And also keep the dialogue going just because you graduate, just because the summer is here, just because, you know, just because life happens, it doesn't mean the dialogue stops. Mm -hmm. The learning does not stop. Yeah. Um, we can all have the baselines and understandings of it, but, you know, every day Sarah and I learn something new about our food or about our culture. Every time we walk in to the vaults of, you know, the field museum, there's something new. Um, it's funny because like, you know, we learn that certain groups out in the West Coast, um, that is not not a dance group, but they would be using like certain items of a ceremonial igorot outfit that is meant for a woman in their waist. They use it as a headgear and it's like, you dumb, bruh. I'm like, wow. Yeah. Um, so that goes to show that these people sometimes are in a world stage and that's how they present our culture and yet you're misappropriating you know things um yeah Raphael, like yeah the film museum is amazing but at the same time unfortunately um it's not accessible to the public um those ten thousand artifacts is not accessible to everybody and Sarah and I just have the privilege to be able to work with um, Manon Lane Wilkin for his research for us to actually have access to this and that's why once in a while we do post them on our social media um, to create awareness that they're there and you know I think just in general um, convey your dialogues in a manner to show 
your elders, your teachers, your peers, how important this kind of um, representation or presentation is to you, because that's the that's the biggest and toughest hurdle that you can do, mm -hmm. or that you can um, tackle. Yeah. I mean, also just will add to that, like, um, if it's anything that I've learned from organizing since being in college is that, like, um, your relationships can last a long time if you nurture them. And even if, like, let's say you get um, notes from an elder on, like, maybe how they, they felt you did something that you maybe shouldn't have or how you could do something better, it's like, you know, sometimes it's hard to receive that criticism in a way that's, that is like, it's met in the spirit of, um, and depending also on another thing I've learned is like, depending on like what your relationship is with that person and like who that person is, like, are they, are they, have they been here since like Marco's times? Have they been here for a long time? Did they just get here? Like, you know, kind of like where they're also coming from, like what's their personal context and sharing these um, notes with you. Um, because honestly, they don't have to, like we don't have to sit here and like spend time to talk to you about like how you guys can make yourself better. Like same thing with the elders, like they don't have to, they don't have to tell you, they, they want to tell you because they want y'all to improve. So like, I think keeping those things in mind Another thing that I will add is that it's also possible to respectfully disagree with an elder and to calmly kind of talk through like, well, you know, ate kuya, you know, mano, this is where I was coming from when I was thinking this and I understand why you said that. And like, you know, maybe you just agree to disagree and that's fine. Um, you know, but just understand that like the relationship is always more important. Like the work is important, the work is important but the relationship is more important than that unless something very egregious goes on and you're just like, well, this is whack. But um, I think you guys are all able to judge like, you know, when the situation is dangerous for you or not, assuming that it isn't, um, you know, you, you just understand that like the relationship is important. That's all. Did anybody else have any other questions at all? Oh yeah, go ahead, Joseph. Um, I guess my only question is, so uh, in Virginia or just on the East Coast, um, I was just wondering if you knew any any way to contact any good networks um, to kind of focus on this, just not just this issue, um, but any issue regarding like Filipino identity, because um, overall it's not like, it's not present, it's just not that accessible at Virginia colleges um, because there isn't that same kind of um, institutional history with it. Like the only reason my organization was founded um, was just so that Filipinos could be together like in one space. Um, and luckily that they together wanted to do more with that. Um, but the thing is like they did not have the resources um, and they kind of just have been spitballing as they've been going on kind of taking what they've known from their parents. But that's the thing is like, there's no instructors, there's no, um, we, I don't even know anyone who kind of performs and there has been like dance groups in like Richmond or like Virginia Beach, um, but they're not to the same extent or performance um, as like um, in the Midwest or in the West Coast. So I was just wondering if you knew any or just good resources nationally to kind of look at um, overall or if you have lists of resources um, and just overall how to find more of these relationships. Because I am, I, I do agree that relationships are the world, it makes the world go around and that's the only way there can be substantial change. I mean, that's why I think these calls are so important and that's why I value them so much. But a lot of it is, I just don't know where to look and I, I wanna start looking more um, because that's a big part of why I think um, it's always felt so technical and, and honestly doesn't even feel like a Filipino cultural show. It just kind of feels like we're, uh, Filipino bodies doing Filipino cultural dances, not necessarily doing all of it together. There are a bunch of different uh, creative Facebook, uh, Filipino American centric Facebook groups. Um, there's also uh, people that are always willing, as Lydia has offered, if your university or organization is at capacity to fly them out, 
Um, Sarah and I have done the same with other universities um, to be either asked to do a guest lecture or a workshop or a something um, that's always negotiable. There is also like, I suppose like it, Joseph, it just depends on what you're really looking for per se that yeah. we can kind of point you in the right direction. Yeah, like a more precise direction. And I was going to add on to that too. It's like, um, your feelings are very valid. Like, I just want to tell you that like, it is normal to feel like fucking lost. And like, I don't even know where to begin. Like, I don't, because these systems are not built for us, right? Like we're building these freaking systems. So like, it's up to us to, um, that's why I said what I said before about like, you know, documenting and then like passing that on like we have to build that like us right now like it's not around because we haven't been here to build it you know what i'm saying so like that's the challenge um you know you need to be better than the people who who like went to your school before you like nothing against them i'm sure they were fine people but like you know it's really hard work to like intentionally document intentionally build systems for the next generation of people coming up through your school so I just wanted to let you know that like we're all building our own boats that we're also on on <laughs> and we're like rowing out there into the reef like Moana. So like yeah, just wanted to encourage you that it's a valid feeling and and we're gonna get through this. It is yeah. So just to even build up some more with that, um, if you wanna just individually like reach out to us and email yeah. us and then just be more if you're more right. concise like these are the topics yeah these right. are like yeah these are the things that we want to learn or these are like how did you do this yeah. are you available to come is anybody available to come right um for the east coast like there is in new york but they're based in new york and there's unipro which is a young professionals um group and one of their board members the closest to you is in dc right now his name is dennis and he is another great friend of ours mm -hmm. and yeah, would great. be a great resource for you as well um i think if you have time to even go to dc and like kind of like build with him that would be great we can go and like let him know That's about awesome. this whole thing yeah yeah um other than that like uh because i know he also has connect dennis also has connections too with like the smithsonian yeah Asian american he i mean he something is something or other yeah like he he's is a your very phone well book. connected <laughs> person so he is your phone book. yeah um kuya dennis is amazing at mentorship like he built yeah. up like um the chapter in texas for unipro and they are doing such amazing work um so there are resources that way for you that is closer to you um we have mentioned a couple of facebook groups that are out there um one of them is called filipino global creatives um so that is on a global stance of like wherever people all the filipinos are and that's also a great resource there is um i mean yeah it just depends on like what kind of like kind of education that you want to bring or what kind of structure you want to bring to your organization to be able to facilitate that. Yeah, I definitely just reach out. I think that would probably be the easiest. Of course, of course. I mean, we're here. We're always on social media, as you can see back and forth. We're on our phones. Um, yeah, just reach out. Just let us know what you really want to, what are your concerns and we can do a one on one. We can you can propose anything to us we can forward it to like the right people mm -hmm. and for you to be able to have that access mm -hmm. yeah um and just i really want to say thank you so much because i actually did a project um my first year um and i stumbled across your website and that's why i had to jump on this call um, because of all of the work that you've done to compile kind of in your area and that's honestly one of the first kinds of things because for me it was filipino food was something that my dad was a chef but he always told me that uh no one really sees filipino food you know why is that son and everything and that's something that i've always kind of thought and seeing kind of the work that you've done and kind of documenting that and seeing the opportunities and seeing it is a lot of me taking it more critically you know what i mean seeing that with the dances and seeing that with just the whole identity and i think that's something that has really been it's really been an honor being able to talk to you right here today oh my oh, gosh stop, stop it You're that's really beautiful cry. thank you um,
Thank but you. you know, to be honest, yeah. like it's amazing that in the last few days we had the New York Times like shed some light in our food. But at the same time, like you know, we have discussions that is very critical of that article. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't normally like put that out um, just because we don't want to take the shine away from the people who are highlighted in that article. Yeah. What we do is we retaliate with our own work, uh, with more research, with more highlighting other people. I mean, as much as we love a lot of those people on their list is our friends, as much as we love them, but we feel they're kind of overexposed yeah. <laughs> and other people needs to, you know, um, to get to know other chefs and that's beautiful. And yeah. thank you. Really. You make our work worthwhile. <laughs> Nina, don't I, cry. <laughs> I, 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 I was trying to <laughs> message Joseph. I literally messaged him. I was like, dude, you're about to make me cry right now, <laughs> man. Oh my gosh. So, um, Basically, in, in like going off the agenda, we kind of touched every discussion, every piece of the agenda, like from when Lydia started to all of us kind of asking questions. Um, and I don't know if anybody else um, has any other questions, but I will, um, if Sarah Lynn and Natalia, if you guys are okay with it, if I could um, like publicize um, our agenda and put your contact information in Lydia's as well. Because um, again, this is live so that people can watch it. Like we'll come back to this on YouTube and watch this later as well. Well, so, I, well we forgot to yay. put the makeup on. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. So Kathy. <laughs> um, I was the only one who like came prepared. <laughs> She she yeah, face B, I swear, Mary Jo. Um <laughs> but um what I'm what we're gonna do, because I know that we kind of we said this is gonna be like about an hour and we kind of ran over. We just wanna thank everybody for coming. Um Filipino Kitchen, we I I think I always knew that you guys are such a good resource. And I think because this is my first like primary resource time with you guys, I really just my eyes have just opened up so much to everything, like every aspect. So this isn't even something you guys really specialize in, but the amount of input and like knowledge that you guys have on this has just I, I keep messaging Nicole and Emily and also the Epic Ambassadors. I'm like, guys, I'm really shook right now. I can't believe they just said that. So thank you guys so, so, so much for um, willing to work out all the scheduling with me and with Mafa board. We appreciate you guys so much. Um, and then at the capacity. Yeah, is everybody yeah. going Emphos? Yes. Yay. And I, I'm trying to get uh, the, the people from the other um, regions yeah. to come too. It just, it's hard. We're all college students, but we're, uh, we're, we'd like to. Right. Um, also, um, yeah. not to cut you off, Nina, but one yeah. last thing. I mean, yeah. two last little things. Two last things. Yeah, of course. Um, one is on from July 11th to the 14th is the. I'll put it in if you want resources, this is the place to go. Yeah, yeah. We're it's telling a really, you this. Really good conference. Filipino American National Historical Society biannual conference is going to be here in Chicago. Um, I know y'all in the Pacific Northwest, y'all have the headquarters over there, but Franz, <laughs> Franz is coming into Chicago and we're also, Sarah and I are, um, organizing after conference events, um, here in the city because it's going to be in Rosemont. July um, 11th through the 14th. 11th right? through the 14th. Um, right. let us know if you guys are going to be down because we definitely at Filipino Kitchen would need some volunteers. So sign up. Um. The second thing, and we have not publicized this, so you guys are getting a first first look or hear it from us first. <laughs> um, Cultura is our baby, is our, it's gonna be our fourth annual Filipino Food and Arts Festival that's gonna be held here again in Chicago, August 19th at Logan Square. Let us know if you guys are be able to come. We do have student pricing um mm -hmm. and we're hoping there's gonna be a couple special performances we're working on it we're <laughs> working on it so <laughs> this one i'm gonna keep it a surprise for you guys because yeah. we can't say it yet. we cannot say it yet. yes we're negotiating people um to bring over chicago <laughs> so yeah let us know um 
we would love to have you guys really um i think to a lot of the peeps that we have met including you know um really joseph you made our hearts like pitter patter yeah that's um, so nice that's so nice and like that's and, the that's the kind of that's the good all. stuff that's the good stuff <laughs> that's and why we do this yeah. so yeah. is you nina so is everybody yes, else here that you're um, here taking time out of your schedules to, yes. to be present so thank you so yeah just just basically let us know and yeah. You know, we have a couple fun summer events coming yeah. up. So, yeah. Watch our social media. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, you can also add us on Facebook, too. I don't. Yeah. I know there's some new faces here from the last call that we did. So, yeah. Um, it's, yeah. I'll put our, I'll put our names here. <laughs> just so that you have. Yeah, yeah, the Facebook names. Facebook yeah. names. Okay. Okay, perfect. I'm going to make sure to um, put your contact information and names um, on the agenda so we could release that for people. Um, and then for um, Mary Jo and Joseph and um, Rafi, I'm gonna, I'll send you guys those directly too so that you guys can reach out um, whenever you'd like. Um, so Blow Pin Kitchen, thank you so much. And Epic Ambassadors, thank you so much for coming because like people in MAFA, like this is something personally for me that I really wanted to do to like have more of an outside voice, not only with professional Filipino organizations like Filipino Kitchen, but also have people, you know, just like us for and you, people know you guys as the other MAFAs of the other regions, like for you guys to actually like, you know, for everybody to kind of just hear what you guys have to say. Like my heart is bursting because as my, my external, my VPE heart and Epic Ambassador heart is just like, I'm, I'm like in love with this entire thing. So thank you guys so much. Um, we're gonna make sure that everybody can get in contact. Um, but like in terms of closing remarks, if anyone else has anything to add, please feel free. But this is kind of our like ending, um, but if anyone wants to add anything, that'd be nice too. <laughs> and if not, everybody enjoy their night and we will make sure everyone gets in contact with each other. So thank you guys so much. Thank you guys. We appreciate it. It was nice talking to all of you guys and meeting you. Thank Bye. You. Thanks. Thanks. It was nice meeting you. I'll be in touch. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night. Good night.